Welcome to another episode of Master Plan. I am your host, Monica Sackmack Grant. Today we are here with Mr. James Felton Keith. He is a candidate for the U.S. Congress in New York for the 13th District. Mm -hmm. Did I say it right? Yeah, you said it right. Awesome, said it right. awesome. Thank you so district. much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Now, before we get into a deep conversation, I mm -hmm. want you to introduce yourself to the world. Well, yeah, as you said, I'm, I'm running. We just announced uh, a few weeks ago that we're running for, and I like to say we because it's a, it's a broad team. I'm that's right. Clearly the front man, but it's a broad team. And yes, we're running for U.S. Congress in the 13th. That's uh, the Upper West Side, Harlem, mm -hmm. Washington Heights, Inwood, mm -hmm. Marble Hill, Riverdale, and really the Western Bronx, west of Fordham Road. Okay. So it's a rather large district. It's a very diverse district. Um, a lot of black and Latino and and white folks just mixed in Sprinkled their neighborhood. In there, yeah, everyone you know. is playing together there. It's probably, I would argue, the most progressive district in in the country. Maybe a few pieces of California mm -hmm, for sure, rival for us, sure. but um, but we're way out there, left of everything, kind of um, pushing the the social agenda forward, pushing the economy forward, and uh, pushing technology forward, pushing politics forward, obviously. And um, the real reason we're running is because I come from this very progressive place uh, in business. Mm -hmm. I've started a few software companies here in the city. Uh, mostly in predictive analytics for finance, for insurance, for advertising, and uh, run a trade association specific to you know data called the International Personal Data Trade Association. We're the largest trade association of data companies. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago, that probably meant technology companies and software companies, but as we grow, what does it mean now? It just means everyone now. So everyone who deals in data, who values their products and services via some tangible evidence of that product and service is a data company. Mm. And so we participate with everyone now because they need to understand more and more the implications of the data they have on hand, mm -hmm. how they distribute it, mm -hmm. who and what it represents, that's whether right. that's individuals or other companies. That's right. And so you know it snowballed into us feeling like we need to not only push a, you know, an economic and business agenda, but also normalize the conversation around what data is. And right. the conversation actually isn't about data, it's about what data represents, whether that's um, people's privacy, people's security, and ultimately, you know, kind of the underlying asset of it all, which is, which is people's value. So... I'm gonna have to stop you. Okay. You saying a lot. Yeah. You saying a lot. Yeah, I'm gonna say You saying a lot. <laughs> yeah, I was like, uh, how do I wrap a box? No, around this? no, yeah. no, yeah. no. And, and and for the audience, like uh, I, I've I've known James uh, from the Personal Data Conference, and I mean that was that was an amazing experience, amazing conference that you put together. Thank you. And this whole daddy data economy, per personal data, is is very new. And so yeah. I'm slowing you down because we yeah. need to, we need to, you got, you got to break it down, you know, granular. Yeah. Um, just for somebody that might just be coming on and saying, the only thing I know about that is that Equifax, you know, just blew it. That's a good example, actually. So <laughs> Equifax is really, it, it's helping us tell more interesting stories with regards to how valuable data is because mm -hmm. I don't think people get it. So you're right. We, we went too far, too fast. Um, so I think a lot of people, at least in the business world, ha are familiar with the term big data. That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the first time I went to a big data conference was 2009. So that's still relatively new. That wasn't 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And just the idea of big data is just you have high volumes, high velocity, and high variance of data in any place. A, you know, a database, a company somewhere. Right, right. And, um, and you're trying to understand it. You're trying to derive some insight from it. But the the new world the new kick is this personalization of all that data w and we're calling it personal data mm -hmm. um, but it's not you know just your social media which I think a lot of people think about they think, they about, think that's what it is right yeah, they think right. Facebook Twitter right. that's my personal data and I want to I want that to be private I want my email address to be private but it's so much more than that it's your it's your financial transactions there's evidence of those mm -hmm. it's your location there's evidence of where you are every moment on the planet whether your phone is on or not and not just from your phone, but my phone knows that you're here. Mm. And uh, the production crew's phone knows that you're here. Mm -hmm. And the sensors in this building and the equipment in here 
uh, and you name it, if you made transactions in this place, there's evidence of you, of you being here. And so, yeah, your location data, but also your insurance data, that information, the information that tries to underwrite what you're worth and how you're worth it and what you're right. willing to spend on that, mm -hmm. that's personal data. And then the, the juggernaut is really your, your healthcare data. Right. Healthcare as an industry is so interesting because it's really like three in one. You have you know hospitality, you have medical services, obviously, and you have IT putting all these things together. But that data really quantifies the essence of your life, and so industries are built around it, whether it's pharmaceuticals. So, or so can I mean with personal data, like you have data on everything. Are you able to even lie anymore? Like. If you if an insurance company says you know have you been to the hospital or are you sick or whatever like can they track you and say nah I seen you smoke another <laughs> day you know uh, yeah we well, yeah, you can still lie well that's where privacy and security come into play because if you if you're looking to tell a lie or even if you're just looking and not give TMI to you know right the average company or the average individual because yeah because that's your prerogative you know I think mm -hmm. that's what it means to be a human is to have some sort of choice mm -hmm. over who gets to know what about you and so privacy and security laws are more built around what you allow somebody to have and when and why so you should be able to say you didn't smoke even if you do smoke and um, you should be, you know, allowed to do that, whether it's ethical or not, as a, as a right, right, conversation. Right, right, right. But yeah, you you technically can. But if I am in the know, if I know how to access your data, whether it's on the dark web or somewhere else, mm -hmm. um, whether it's just sitting in your phone and I can hack it, then uh, then no. You know, I think everything is known. Right. Everything is available to be known. I, I think. Yeah. Let me rephrase it. So I think. We're at, the, we're at the end of the information age. Like, it's over. We've identified what information is and where it is. We mm. don't know it all yet. Like, I don't know every single thing about you, but I could access it if I wanted to know more. Okay. So, so there's no such abundant. thing as privacy. Yeah. So, so no, there is there's a such thing as privacy, but, you know, Privacy is an, is an interesting concept. Is it more of a right? Like, I have a right to for you to, like, a cease and desist, like, leave me alone. This is my private information, e although I can still access it if I wanted to hack you or something. Like, how does that work? So, privacy is not a right. It's not a human right because it's not something that we can um, mm. define in a, blanket, in a blanket sense. That's why it's not written into the Constitution. But, um, hmm. but agency over yourself is sort of... Um, you know, a general a general right th that we haven't written in the law, but I think any judge would always say if you were retaliating against me for violating, you know, your privacy, mm -hmm. then in, in most circumstances you would you would win that lawsuit because um, because you should have say, you should have choice of what happens to you or what I get to know about you or things that disseminate from you, mm -hmm. uh, whether those are data points or not. But you know. To be clear, everything is a data point now. So everything that you are physi physically has a zero and a one attached to it somewhere. Right, right, you know, your, right. Your electrons have the same metadata that a tweet has. Um, but but privacy is a more interesting concept. It's um, it's something you know you design rights and privileges to. So you say I can have the right to know certain things about you, and. You know, you can exclude me from having the right to know mm -hmm. certain things about you. So it's, it's stuff that you can turn on and off, and different people have different preferences. So how do you, I mean, is this like a legal document that you have to file to say, I want certain companies uh, or institutions to have this information and certain others to not have this information? Like, how do you implement that? So the way it works here right now is um, it's interesting because it's kind of written. It's not something that you have to... Uh, so the uh, basically things in the United States because it's different in other countries they're broken down by industry mm -hmm. and you have to opt out of certain privileges that are granted to you for divert divulging information about yourself to you know your, your healthcare provider Google Facebook you name it mm -hmm. um, you can design a document and send it to them but in most cases a simple you know cease and desist an email it, you know that's legal tender as well. Okay. And you can say stop mm -hmm. doing whatever. Mm -hmm. And also, in most cases, the international community requires an institution, which I think you know, is identified by a group of individuals, 
has to let an individual, just a single person, know what their intentions are. Okay. And they have to meet those intentions. So I can't tell you I want to use your data to build, you know, glasses mm -hmm. uh, for you, and then also build, um, you know, a telescope. Not that that would actually be. Uh, that's really not a good example, but whatever. <laughs> I can't build something that has nothing. I think that's the point. You can't, I can't build something that has nothing to do with the first thing. Okay. Even if, um, even if they seem generally so. Your information you has to be intrinsic to yeah. the development of the product or the company. Well, yeah. Now nowadays, that's the you know that makes us more productive. You know, like mm -hmm. your data is an input to to every single thing. Like I would, if I only knew you like in this space and time, I didn't know you anything else about you mm -hmm. and let's say you know I'm, I'm Amazon and I want to sell you a shirt I would only sell you this checkered shirt right I wouldn't try to sell you stripes or polka dots unless I knew that you like those because it would mean that because I don't know you I might have to spend some extra time and money marketing you to say hey you should really love polka dots right to switch over yeah. right so what I do is take your input and give you back something that I know you want okay and it makes the production process a lot shorter a lot sleeker mm -hmm. and um, and it allows me to free up time and capital to do other things mm -hmm. uh, like sell somebody else the polka dot shirt right. that, that I can also pump out pretty easily but because you are now the input now you compel the production process mm -hmm. you are one of the producers Gotcha. So now your your input to that that's, productivity. That's the perfect customer relationship. It's kind of like on demand. It's ideal, right? Because the way it used to work is I would try to sell you a gray suit whether you wanted to wear one or not. That's right. Um, and that's I'll tell right. you why gray is so amazing. Mm -hmm. you like gray mm -hmm. is the greatest color on the planet. You're like, right. I, don't, I don't really feel yeah. that. I like blue. Yeah. So. But you hire a sales team to continue to push that. You absolutely do. You have to right. do that. And so that's more time, more money. It makes you uh, arguably less productive mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. in doing that. That makes sense. That makes sense. Give people what they want, well, yeah, or what they need, which which we know they need, though. Well, right. So there's a there's a market for both. I think you know leadership is still always uh, necessary. So some people, you know, if you think about children, for instance, if never if no one ever grew up, and you know you're trying to sell them vegetables, and they're like, well, I like his jelly beans, so just sell right. jelly beans, <laughs> right? So there's a sort of, you know moral leadership and people who have knowledge that we don't, whether you call them a you know an educator or a doctor, you mm -hmm. name it, saying, you know, this is why these things are good. Right, right, you. right. And so marketing is, is still necessary. No production process is perfect. But uh, those, you know, people who require these products and services, whether they're, you know, vegetables or anything else, they still, um, they still are inputs to that production process because you can identify, you know, that they have a, a need for them. So I think the the old capitalistic model has been flipped on its head where it was um, uh, product feed and demand. Now it's kind of demand mm -hmm. you know, compelling product. How much of uh, the current economy, at least in America, is up on that? Like they understand like this is the, the shift and this is how we're using data. That's difficult. I mean, it's difficult to put a number on it, but I would say a very, a relatively small percentage of the economy is aware, or just of the population, is aware of how how valuable they are to the the knowledge economy. Mm -hmm. So we we throw that language around a lot in the news, or at least it's something that I've heard a lot. When people talk about the knowledge economy, the knowledge economy, the knowledge economy is really about me knowing a bit more about you, so that I can get you what you need. And I would say even while people talk about it, they think the knowledge economy is service work. So I'm a, you know, a lawyer or an accountant or mm -hmm. a doctor or mm -hmm. some subject matter expert. It's not just that, but those subject matter experts are pulling information about us and making better decisions about what to supply us with. Right. So again, it's demand driving supply instead of supply driving demand. If we think about the 1950s and the jingles and the marketing and the... Um, processed food for instance that everyone was eating we had a whole lot of supply because we figured out how to make these products more broadly right and then we need to market them on everybody about why they were so great how convenient they were mm -hmm. you know you pop them in a microwave mm -hmm. you can have a whole nother mm -hmm. life you can you know do all these things mm -hmm. uh and it was compelling right for a time but now the new economy is demand driven everything is individualized you want something totally different than what i want right um and so no when, more mass production. No, well, well now, the, I think one of the interesting thing is even if, 
even if it's not mass production, we have the technological means to produce unique things in mass fashion because we have gotcha. so much access to people. So even while I wouldn't make, you know, two million of those shirts anymore or that, you know, canned food anymore to distribute to somebody, I might make I might make, you know, 500,000 units of it, but I, I know what that market is now mm -hmm. because I'm mm -hmm. pulling data on them. Mm -hmm. So I can micro-target them where they let me know mm -hmm. exactly what mm -hmm. they need. So I push that there. And I, so I'm still using the same manufacturing processes. I'm just, um, you know, I'm processing more goods and I know how valuable it is because I'm getting directly to the demand. The demand comes first now, whereas the supply used to come first. That's right. That's right. And because demand is first, it makes us that much more valuable. That's right. It, yeah. So, so, so most of the audience is millennials and a little bit older. Mm -hmm. um, if they're seeing this and they've never heard of the knowledge economy, personal data, how would they use this information? I think that well, I think well, it, it depends on what they want. Like, so if they're looking for. You mean like from a from a job standpoint, from a you know just from a, from an income standpoint? Yeah, let's talk. Are we, are let's we talk from are we income. about money. Or are we talking about? I like to talk about people's money, but we can talk about other stuff. Well, most people are concerned about money right now, so let's let's talk about money. Yeah. Okay. So they always concerned about money. Yeah, we always yeah, we always yeah, want yeah, the money. Yeah, let's talk about the money. About money. Yeah. Um, I would say the best way for them to use this is if they're arguing for more money, mm -hmm. um, whether it's at their employer um, or or payback from places that they've been a piece of, being a contributor I say the new argument is that you know economists establish productivity as a measure of inputs and so the reason why I want uh, a legal right a constitutional right to own my input is because if I'm an input to your process even if it's selling me the shirt on my back mm -hmm. I want my two cents on my point zero two cents, or right. my point zero zero two cents, right? Because I know that it adds up over time. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. even if you don't have, you know, the the mechan the IT mechanism to track those two cents and then figure out what you owe me later, if you don't have that, I want to get together with a collective of people like me to mm -hmm. say, I want you to send me my money in some other group form or fashion. Mm -hmm. So I want a big number here for a hundred of us. Mm -hmm. A million dollars mm -hmm. for a hundred of us and we should be straight with An that. information union. Exactly. Or I want it to be poured into, you know, when you think about modern government, you can say, well, I want it to be poured into the healthcare structure. So yeah, you can't huh. identify okay. what you give me back, but I want to be able to, you know, get my eyes fixed, get my teeth clean, get my hair cut, That's I want right. to do That's things right. like that. Um, or you can say, you know, I want to learn more about this. Uh, but I want to spend time getting to know myself. I want to self-actualize. Um, I can't afford all that right now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I want $200,000 worth of education. Right. I mean, that's how right. much student loans I had. That's right. So, that's right. you know, I want to be able to do that. Or, you know, I want to be able to ensure that I can afford this roof over my head for long enough mm -hmm. for me to become, you know, a formidable, productive person in in this space that I come from, right. whether it's my neighborhood or whatever. I'm from the Bronx, I'm from Manhattan, I'm from whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if they're advocating on behalf of themselves, then they could do it where there's you know, cash coming directly to their pockets, or they can advocate for themselves you know, in caucus, in a group, you know, in a union uh, of some sort, to say that we are, we are owed these things because this piece of the economy is kind of built on what you know about us. That's right. That's so, right. And, it, and so, it, you know, it's just like, you know, creating oil companies, you know, two centuries ago, and they extracted a lot, you know, from the ground, and uh, productivity ran rampant because of that. But the local governments required that they poured back into these communities. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at any, you know, oil riddle place, now, there's environmental issues. There's environmental issues. Um, they usually create a whole bunch of wealth, and you know it's up to the large group of people to figure out how it gets distributed. And the same thing is happening with data right now. Every single one of the largest companies on the planet are data companies, whether we're talking about Apple or Amazon or Google or mm -hmm. Facebook. They can be new or old, but the biggest ones are data driven. That's right. They dwarf oil companies. I remember being really. Black. Well, yeah, Apple's Apple's larger than Exxon Mobil right now, wow. from a capital standpoint. Wow. 
I never thought about that. Yeah, Tesla is a bigger company than Ford Motor Company, and they sell a fraction of the cars. And it's because of the data that they mm. collect in the cars. They're okay. their devices now. Right, right, right. And so I think I think it shocked people who watch the financial markets to learn that Ford Motor Company is a smaller company from a capitalization standpoint than Tesla. Tesla sells like three cars. Right, right. Ford sells like three million. That's right. I mean, you know, that's the the proportion of what they sell, but it's the the way the cars are made and the information that they take back. And so what the markets are, are really, the the markets are kind of the most awesome collective of people saying that we're going to agree and trust each other to be here tomorrow mm -hmm. and we're going to invest in tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So when we look at every company, this is what we think is going to be worth tomorrow. So the whole market is saying we think Tesla, a company that makes a fraction of the cars, is much more valuable than Ford Motor Company one of the oldest automakers, you know, on right, the planet. Right, you know, the, the core right, original innovator. Right. And they also are saying that about, they're saying Apple, who primarily sells phones mm -hmm. and music, or you maybe used to sell music, Yeah. Uh, that they're more valuable than Exxon Mobil. Right. Apple is the biggest company from a dollar standpoint on the planet. Wow. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people realize that. So, so Amazon how, is bigger than Walmart. So, how did like how do you get involved in this? Like, how do you like how do you jump in and say I want to make money? I want I want to I want to be a part of this data economy. How do I do it? Well, I think it really depends on who you are. I think the really cool thing is even when we throw around terms like identity politics right now, it's like people's identities are now what's so rigidly valuable. Mm -hmm. And so, because they are influencers. Well, yeah, right. And so it's just like, what do I enjoy most? Mm -hmm. And that's where that's where I want to start. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't say unless you're really young that the objective is retooling. It's just what do I enjoy the most? If it's media stuff, then I'm in that. If it's engineering, if it's autos or whatever, then I'm in that. I want to look at you know how autonomous vehicles are valuable and what information do they kick back in, you know, and what have you. If I'm into you know music, if I'm into mobile phones, if I'm into just analysis in general, mm -hmm. I would look at you know, the kinds of companies that play with that sort of data. But the first thing I would do is look at me. I would say, where am I most, where am I easiest, most easily used? Like, how do I fit in? Your niche. Yeah, like, like what is my niche? I mean, that's, that's more of like a, a career objective. But what I would say, aside from all that is, if, if I was an activist, if I'm in the streets talking about, you know, where's my piece of the pie, I think, what is rarely acknowledged, even when we talk about this data, um, these data issues, is the fact that people have a, an intrinsic value, and, and one thing that they need to always be advocating for is that. So there's some base pay mm -hmm. that everyone should have access to because they're a contributor mm -hmm. to the productivity. So it all goes back to those economics of productivity as established by inputs. Right. And I am identifying my input and saying I want my piece. So it's the same as, um, you know, there's a, a sort of movement that never stopped brewing, and this has been around for hundreds of years, called basic income. Everyone's always talking about this basic universal income. Universal pay. Yeah, right, universal pay, where everyone has kind of a, a basic check that they get every mm -hmm. month. Mm -hmm. The current argument is about welfare, which is, which is a, a decent argument. I'm a product of welfare. I think, you know, welfare is, is those are not programs that need to go away, but you can't build growth on the backs of welfare. I think in modern welfare in this country, it was really started by you know FDR, and FDR called it relief. He didn't call it welfare. He just said, this is a little relief mm -hmm. to get you over the hump. Mm -hmm. And But what you need is something to be there when you get over the hump. Right. What we don't have is that anymore because we don't have, you know, the people who are asking for welfare don't own anything. This is the newest way to make them owners in the new economy. Right. I say, after you get over that hump, here's the thing you own, and here's your check, and it's no longer a basic income check for welfare. Now it's a basic income for what you owe because of what you own. What you're doing, yeah. right? And so it's you know, I just because like you the own your, your, your information. Yeah. I like the it's like I like the song of basic income, but it's like the worst lyrics. Right. You know, right, it's, right, right. You know, it's it's just it's a weak argument. Right. So so it's how 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 real is that to actually happening? Like what I think we can implement it right now. So a lot of these things I'm talking about. At least from a, the reason, the main reason I'm running for office is because number one, no one's having this conversation in the right way. Absolutely not. But also, all these policies that we want to pass here to make this a reality are pretty simple, pretty straightforward, and we've already passed them in about 30 other countries. Mm -hmm. So, in my day job, 
when I'm not here in the city, we're you know in the EU, in Singapore, in Australia, passing policies that that really look like cybersecurity policies. They're talking about privacy and security. But okay. if, you, if you're going to establish a security policy of any sort at your company or at your government, what you have to establish is what you're protecting. Okay. And so what you protect is you, mm -hmm. your personal data, your personhood. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, a new human right exists in the EU that we don't really have here, uh, at least not in a pervasive way, and it's called the right to erasure. The right to erasure is like the right to be forgotten or total agency over your information because now that you have the right to, when you leave a setting, say I want you to wipe everything you know about me. Right. That gives you, that gives you some, some control over, over what this input is. Mm -hmm. And that control is really everything. That ownership is everything. And we've already established it everywhere else. And so after establishing that, and we really established it like NQ with a lot of organized labor because they know that their new argument now is not just specific to wages for time, but it's specific to equity on the productivity of the companies that they deal with. Yeah, so how, how, how are unions adapting to this conversation? Yo, I'm living my life and everything ain't always good But I'm doing what I want cause I'm the boss and I'm gon' do it Yo, I'm living my 